Welcome to everybody who's joining us for tonight's talk back, uh, where we'll be discussing some of the issues raised by tonight's film Advocate. And we thank the League of Women Voters of Teaneck for sponsoring tonight's showing. Uh, my name's Daniel Reinhold. I'm a Teaneck resident of 13 years, having moved here from London, England in 2007. I'm a professor of philosophy and dean of the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies at Yeshiva University. And it's my great ple pleasure and privilege tonight to introduce you to our guest, Dr. Smadar Ben Natan, uh, a longtime Israeli human rights lawyer herself and currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington, Seattle. Um, Dr. Ben Natan specializes in the sociology of law, criminal justice, national security, um, and international law. And her research focuses on military courts and political prisoners in Israel and Palestine. As an attorney, she's litigated cases of Palestinians' human rights on issues such as criminal justice, torture, imprisonment, family unification, asylum and land access. And she has long known the subject of our movie tonight, Lea Tzermel, uh, and regards her as something of a role model. So um, Dr. Ben Natan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for having me. It's very pleasure. pleasure. Uh, I did a talk back on Tuesday with a panel of three stand-up comedians. So to say that this is going to be a very different discussion uh, rather stretches even British understatement. Uh, this was a very thought-provoking and at times tough movie to watch. It deals with serious and emotive issues. I imagine it's provoked some strong emotional reactions in our audience. So I want to just remind everybody before we begin that this conversation is going out live so that if you have any questions that you would like me to put to Dr. Ben Natan, uh, you can put them in the chat and I will endeavor to ask a selection of them um, in the time that we have. Uh, but to begin with, to kick us off, uh, Dr. Ben Natan, I imagine people will be interested to hear about your own background in these areas and your relationship with Lea Semel herself. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I've been um, a human rights lawyer myself in Israel for about 18 years. And uh, like you already said, Leah has been a kind of a role model to me, but not the only role model. So um, both her and the Victor Feldman that we all see in the film were like the lawyers that you heard of when I was in law school um, as human rights defenders and particularly Palestinian rights defenders. Uh, of course, during my years of practice, I've known Leah. Um, I became a friend with her. I used to see her in courts and prisons and all those uh, type of, types of places where we practiced. And she, she strikes as a very formidable character um, as we, we see her in the movie. Um, and I, I imagine that's reflected in her, uh, <laughs> in knowing her in real life too. Yes, of course. I must also say I'm good friends also with uh, Rachel and Philippe, the directors of the film. So it feels like a little bit of in the family, uh, this entire film. Yeah, Lea is an unusual character, even within this community of lawyers uh, that we do have in Israel who, who defend the rights of Palestinians. So um, her resilience, her persistence, uh, and her way of not becoming cynical about the legal process and about the political struggle. She somehow maintains um, this passion, this passion um, and, um, and not becoming cynical is, is something very, very special to her. And I think it strikes any, anyone who watches the film. Right. Um, so with regards to, to what we're actually uh, seeing in the movie, obviously, there's the idea that everybody has a right to a legal defense, uh, which is a fundamental to the, to the rule of law in democracies. Um, and in, in Leia's case, um, and in all of these cases, obviously one can't ignore the context, which is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I, I'm interested in the interplay between law and politics here, and to what extent she and those like her, I suppose, are animated by the simple belief in the right of everybody to a defense attorney on the one hand, but also to what extent her work is informed by her belief that her clients are themselves victims of injustice. So I think um, she states it pretty clearly in the film 
um, not only that she sees her clients as victims of injustice, she sees them as the oppressed side in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or in the occupation of uh, Palestine. And she does, she represents them from a position of solidarity and of resistance, of being part of their resistance. So of course she does, she does believe that every person um, is entitled to a representation. That's like a baseline. And I maybe in a different context, she would be a public defender that would defend um, anyone, but in a particular context, there is this. And on top of that, there is, um, this is her way as an Israeli to be an ally, to show solidarity and to practice resistance to the Israeli occupation and support of the Palestinian struggle. Right, and I, I guess a, a follow-up to that um, uh, would be that in, in the movie herself, she, she of course describes herself as, a, as an occupier. Um, so I'm interested, how, how do uh, the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian population, is she well known beyond obviously her clients, but beyond that in the Palestinian population, is she, is she well known and kind of held up as some sort of, um, you know, fighter for their rights? How, how, did, how did the Palestinians view her, uh, given that she describes herself in that way? So this might be one of the only points where I disagree with her description of herself as an occupier. And I, I might get back to that, but the point you raise about how Palestinians view her is a good um, test for that question. She's very well known by Palestinians. Um, you see Hanan Ashrawi, who's the uh, very prominent Palestinian yeah. leader who breastfed Leah's daughter. So they are really um, kind of sisters. And so she's very well known, very well respected. Leah's daughter says in the film that if you get into trouble, you just have to say, Anna bint Leah Tzemel, and I'm the daughter of Leah Tzemel, and nothing wrong will be done to you. So obviously, Palestinians don't see her as an occupier. And I think she, she assumes responsibility for what her state does, what her government does when she describes herself as an occupier. So she is part of an occupying state, but I for once have no doubt that she personally is not an occupier, she's an ally and she's um, a resistor um to the to the occupation right um we actually have a question from uh the audience here um which and in, in a way i think maybe it relates to something we were chatting beforehand and and um karen one of the producers asked whether there was any any um anything that Leah wouldn't defend um but th there's a question here that's um asking that if any act that a Palestinian could commit is a priori not a crime because the occupation justifies those actions, then the concern is that if one rejecting the premise of the law um, and in doing so, how one can be an advocate within a legal system um, that maybe doesn't share the assumption that occupation justifies all crime. I don't think that Leah's position, and certainly not my position, is that occupation justifies any crime or that, the, or that the acts that some Palestinians do in resisting the occupation are not crimes. The, the, the argument rather is these are crimes that are committed in a context that is political, in a context where the perpetrators of these crimes are themselves subject to crime all the time. If you look at state terror, if you look at the conditions under which these people live, you cannot ignore these con this context when you look at the crimes that they do commit. And so, so it is, the, the argument is, is not that it is not a crime, but rather that it is a political act within a context and you should take that into account. Um, so Leah maintains that they have a right to resist uh, the occupation. It does not mean that any means of resistance is legal. So it's not actually 
um, you know, dismissing the, the entire idea uh, of law, of, of criminal law, of offenses, of course not. But th there's, there's an un underlying politics of that that needs to be taken into account. Right, right. And that, I, uh, I suppose that also relates to uh, the question of, uh, um, I mean, the main case in the movie of, of Ahmed, this 13-year-old, uh, um, which was, uh, uh, you know, very much, uh, I think, the focus. And there are moments there where, um, without ignoring that he has done something very wrong, um, we get a glimpse of his initial interrogation where, and, and this is obviously some may disagree, but speaking perso personally, I, I found it quite difficult to hear his distress and, you know, a frightened child in an interrogation like that. Um, within that case, uh, Ahmed, of course, insists that he had no intent to, to kill anybody. Uh, and Lair seems to rely on that in, in part in not taking a plea deal which some might argue turned out in that case to uh, not have served him best given the outcome. Uh, now in that case, I can only assume the judge thinks Ahmed is lying and there was intent and that leads to his judgment and the lengthy sentence. But in, in a case like this, does Lair see this simply as a disagreement on the facts about intent, uh, which is admittedly gonna be difficult to conclusively determine or are there deeper concerns about a Palestinian, and in this case in particular, Palestinian child's ability to get justice through the Israeli court system? Well, I think obviously there are deeper concerns about the, the systemic possibility of, of getting individual justice in such a collective context of a conflict. Um, but, I think that this particular case was very, very unprecedented in many ways. So I wanna return maybe, and this is also relevant to the last question. People forget that by the end of the film, but the film starts when she uh, talks to a client and persuades him to take a deal of 28 years in prison. Right, the first scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she knows how to do that. It's not that she fights every case like she fought this case. When, you know, when the evidence are, are strong and there's no other way around it, she would get her client to admit and take 28 years in prison. So this case is really unprecedented for her. She says that. It's the first time she had a child this young. He was 13. Like, think about your bar mitzvah, okay? And everybody in the audience, think about kids they know at their bar mitzvahs or even a year later, he was almost 14. He was very, very young. And this, who did a very serious um, case, like he went and, and, and stabbed other people. So it is unprecedented. It was, the case was in the midst of a wave of similar cases, not as extreme as that, but it, would, it was called the, the Knives Intifada. So it was around 2015. And there were many, many cases of either young Palestinians or either, you know, people not affiliated with any organization or any broader, um, you know, protest, just getting out and trying to stab people. And that was, both very, very frightening on the Israeli side. People were really afraid like to take buses, to, to go on the street. It was, um, it was unprecedented in this sense as well. And I think what Leah was trying to do, first of all, it was unprecedented to her too um, and, and, and to the legal system more generally. And I don't think she could even relying on precedents, which what lawyers do, she could not have imagined that the court would sentence him to so many, to so many years. It was unimaginable at, at that time. And she, she was, the, the, the other reason why it was unprecedented is because he did not confess. And that is also very, very unusual. So most um, 
people under such an interrogation, they do confess this way or another. And then there's not much to do with their case. But in his case, being so young, doing such a serious act and not confessing, it was a really, really um, um, tough case to handle. And she, I think that because of his young age, she thought she could turn this case on the facts. Right. She thought that she, she, she thought that she could get the sympathy of the court to look at this kid and to really make a decision on it's it's not even the fact that what he what he said and the way he reacted and the way he explained what he did, but she turned out to have been very very wrong, um, and that that is obvious. Right, right. I um I mean, as you say, this was a, a unusual case uh, given the age and given the context in which it occurred. Um, one of the one of the shocking things I found was right at the very end we see um, a um, a subtitle, so to speak, um, that tells us that Tarek, who worked these cases with her, was uh, now facing charges himself. Yeah. Um, and and doing a, just a, a minimal research, um, it seems that the cases that were the focus of this movie were what broke him. Um, in some of the reporting, at least that, that's what was presented in the reports. So we're always presented with two extremes. On the one hand, a, a child who is uh, very young and has been probably, um, you know, formed by those around him, not yet particularly well-educated, let us say, and a, an extremely well-educated lawyer on the other. Um, it seems difficult to just apply the, the kind of a straightforward label terrorist for all of these acts. Um, what do you think this tells us about the current state of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and maybe how the narrative has changed over the past 50 years or so? I'm just thinking, I, I, uh, in my own work, I've looked at um, a very well-known Israeli public intellectual from the 20th century, Yeshaho Leibovitz, who, uh, um, in an, a very uh, pithy answer that he gives when he's asked about his reaction to the Six Day War, um, he called it he called it a catastrophe. And somebody asked him at what point after the Six Day uh, War, Milchemet uh, Sheshayamim in Hebrew, did you call it a catastrophe? And his answer for those speak Hebrew was by Yom Hashvi'i on the seventh day. Uh, I, my feeling is that was quite an unusual and unpopular view at that point in time, to put it mildly. Um, and yet certainly at the very least, it's, it's gained some credence over time that whatever one's own political views on, on, the, on the particular issues, uh, that you know this has not played out well for anybody. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in how, the, how you see or think that the the narrative of the conflict has changed over time and the fact that we now have not only a 13 year old boy and obviously hardened terrorists as well, but also somebody like Tarek um, ending up feeling that uh, despite everything that he's done and all his work um, and his education and his dealing with people like Leia, nonetheless ends up on the other side. Yeah, I think, um that might be one of the most devastating um, issues that the film raises, mm -hmm. the hopelessness to which Palestinians have um, reached. And I think most certainly it's also a question of Palestinian leadership and Palestinian society. So, I, you know, it's, it's a, there, there, there are many, many aspects to this issue. And I think that the fact that kids like Ahmed in the film and people like Tariq do what they do is, is also motivated by, by the fact that they don't see their leadership as proposing or, or succeeding in promoting any better future um, for them. So, and, and the film does give you that perspective of Palestinian resistance over the years through the cases that Leah did. And you can right. see how during the seventies and the eighties, there was organized 
um, and political um, resistance, while now it seems like desperate acts of individuals. Um, and and um, this is certainly um, not, not encouraging at all. Um, with regards to Israel, so yeah, Yeshayahu Leibovich had an incredible foresight um, in the way he was able to actually, you know, see what many people didn't see. And I think many more people see that now, but I think it's, saying that it didn't turn out well for everybody does not reflect how a big majority of the Israeli public sees it right now. So the supporters of the current government and the governments in the past um, 10 or 15 years do think that it worked well for them. So they are for expanding um, settlements. They are openly for annexing um, the West Bank without giving full citizenship rights to Palestinians. So there is a project of annexing this territory without the people. So without giving civil rights to, to these people. Um, and it might not have seemed that, that way um, 40 or 50 years ago, but I think the division around that now is, is more apparent, you know, both on um, on both sides, and and a big portion, the actually the, the hegemony, um, right right now in the Israeli public is not seeing it as a misfortune. Um, it's it's seeing it as a step um, in the way of creating the greater Israel. Right, right. We. Um an interesting uh, another question that's come in that actually I'm going to incorporate into something I was going to refer to as well. Um, uh, the one victory that we see in the movie is the 1999 decision regarding the use of um, what are euphemistically called special measures, I believe, um, by Shimbet and uh, Victor Feldman, who you mentioned you uh, um, worked with. Uh, yeah. seems to see this as a bit of a Pyrrhic victory that exists more on paper than in reality. Um, in your experience, what is the reality today regarding human rights and the use of such methods by the authorities? And I just, this was triggered the question, um, the very specific question that's been asked by the audience is whether there has to be, surely there should have been an adult present when a minor was being interrogated. Uh, we didn't see in the room, but, you know, we just heard the um, you know the interrogator um, yelling at him. Um, so you know those two I guess go together in terms of the question of you know um, rights and the use of the various methods uh, in these cases. Yeah. So first of all, there is no right to a presence of an adult in the interrogation, and there was no adult in this interrogation. And right. I would assume that if there were an adult you know, on the side of um, the child, either a lawyer, a parent, a relative, it, the interrogation would not have looked the way, the way it did. So I, I, don't, I don't see an interrogator allowing himself to, sh to you know, to shout like that in the, in the presence of another adult who's supportive um, of the child. And I think this is one, this was one of the main, um, Lessons learned in Britain uh, from, from many cases of false convictions where people, um, uh, you, you might remember that. So, so one of the main changes that was done in, in the law in Britain is to allow for a presence of a lawyer in an interrogation. Israel does not have that, not even. Um, so um, there's a possibility for, for presence of parents but it's very limited and it's not the they can interrogate without the parents so and, and we see the the result there um on the more general issue of the the anti-torture case that i was privileged to take part in as a very young lawyer so uh when i started working with a victor feldman that case was pending in court and i was part of the proceedings and it was it was a great victory um and, and it still is very important. It had, though, been um, eroded, let's say, um, over the years. So certainly there are less 
special interrogation measures and torture and ill treatment, like we um, like we call that, certainly less than there was before. There's um, little question about that, but the both the legal system and the security service have found ways around that. So they define certain interrogations as necessity interrogations. So interrogations that are regarded as urgent and uh, and pressing, and they use special measures, physical, very harsh special measures, torture and ill treatment in these interrogations. I represented several cases uh, like that, and, and they, they don't deny that. They just say it's justified because of the necessity. So necessity justifies um, ill treatment. They don't admit it, it to be torture. They argue that it's ill treatment. Um, and they say that it is justified. And, and subsequent decisions of the Supreme Court have really downplayed the prohibition on torture, but have not um, explicitly overruled that precedent. So in a way it's useful that the precedent has not been overruled because you can still say torture are prohibited when you are representing people who were tortured or tortured or ill-treated. Um, so at least like the fact that it's still on the books, even not totally in practice is useful in defending people. It is not useful in proving or arguing that torture and ill-treatment actually take place because people say, oh, but it's prohibited, but the Supreme Court prohibit, how could it be that torture is still practiced. Um, it is possible there are always loopholes in the law um, that are created and being taken taken advantage of. Um, there's writing on that. There's NGO reports. Um, so legal victories, you know, are important <laughs> uh, and and, and um, do do make a difference. It's just it's a constant struggle. It doesn't end there. It never ends there. It never ends with a decision of the court. There's, there's the practice behind that. There are all the bureaucratic agencies, the security service, the Ministry of Justice, all that mechanism, the security apparatus that is working behind that, that put that into practice and maintaining um, this achievement, like, like generally um, fighting for human rights. It's just a constant struggle. Right. Do you, um, how was the movie? Do you know how the movie was actually was received in Israel when it came out? So the, the movie created a great controversy in Israel. Um, it was presented in the Doc Aviv Festival, which is the international film, film festival, uh, the annual international film festival of Israel, and it received the first prize. And that brought it to um, the press. And then there was enormous um, protest right. against the decision of the festival to show the film, to award the film with the first prize. And there were calls to halt the funding for that festival and for the, and for the Tel Aviv Cinematheque that is uh, holding the festival. And um, the National Lottery, which is providing some of the funding to that, had decided to halt their funding for a while. They were, there were demonstrations um, of how, how can you glorify um, a figure that protects terrorists. Um, so, and Leia was under very severe attacks. Well, she's used to that, but it hasn't happened in a while. So. <laughs> Um, it's never fun. Um, in the end, um, the lottery did release the funding, like after a while, after things calmed down. Um, so nothing really extreme happened, but there were very, very serious repercussions for the filmmakers, for Leia herself. I must say that I was not in Israel then, but I heard from, from my friends, from the directors, that in contrast to that, they filled so many um, screenings for that film. 
Like the cinema, the Tel Aviv Cinematheque was showing it after the festival for weeks and months and so many people have seen it and so many people loved it. So for the public, there was a very big public who wanted to see this film, who supported this film, who thought it was useful to reflect on where we are um, now in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Right, right, sure. Um, just one question that uh, we've had a number of questions come in that we're kind of at, our, at the end of our time. Um, but I, I just one just to ask for, I guess, clarification. Uh, somebody's written to us that unless they're mistaken, they would note there's a big difference between uh, the American Israeli trial system in, in that the Israeli system doesn't have juries, so you can't work on a jury's emotions, whereas the judges are um, hopefully more professional in, um, in being able to dissociate those things. Um, and I, I presume just in, in terms of that, that is the case in terms of the difference, at least. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's true that Israel doesn't have a jury system and there are professional judges. Um, but I think um, no case is better <laughs> to demonstrate that even judges have emotions and, and can act on prejudice um, than, the, that the, than the film we've just seen. So, right. although in, in these extreme circumstances and although judges are professionals, these cases many times expose, you know, prejudices and, um, you know, conceptions of the judges and their, their alliance, their, their position of animosity towards Palestinians and um, an image of, it's us versus them. So on whose side are you? And I can tell you from personal experience um, that appearing, litigating in courts and representing Palestinians in front of professional judges is a very hard experience. So the, the film was, was um, filmed outside of court, so you couldn't see the judges. Right, right. I can tell you that they're very harsh on us as lawyers and on our clients. And I don't know if you've seen the trial of the Chicago Seven with, um, with that hostile judge. Right. This is a very common treatment that we are getting in the courts if we are representing Palestinians on you know, politically um, sensitive cases. Right. I'm just, I, I'm gonna take the bit of just asking one final question that's come in on the chat. Um, uh, somebody writing, they appreciated very much the opportunity to learn more about Leib Semel, uh, but this person was, was disheartened when they saw the women kissing Ahmed at the end and saying that all Palestinian women are the mothers of martyrs. Um, and he, when he was 13 years old, uh, and how does one deal with, with the support, the, the outpouring of love and support for such um, martyrs um, is a question that's come in. It's, it's a difficult question, uh, yeah. and I'm not sure I have the answer for it. I think that we need to understand that the love and support is not only for what he did, but also for what he is and for where he is and for, for the circumstances that have brought him to this um, situation. So I, I don't think that it necessarily represents support for his actions. I think in many cases it doesn't. It represents the solidarity and support after the case of what he has to, to handle now. Um, but certainly, you know, there, there are different um, positions within the Palestinian public. Some of them might also support that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not attempting to either support or explain that. This, this is how things are. I'm just, I'm just saying that um, I think we should remember that um, Palestinians are exposed to very um, serious violence all of the time by people who wear a uniform and therefore we don't see them as criminals or as perpetrators, but being subject to violence and, and to you know, many other forms um, of, of oppression is, um, 
is, is leaves a mark on, on the society as a whole and on individuals. Um, from having asked that question, you starting off by saying that, you know, it's a difficult one and you don't really have an answer. It's probably a very appropriate way to, to end this. We've had half an hour. We're certainly not going to solve the Israel-Palestinian conflict between the two of us right now. Um, and it's very clear uh, from the comments that people have probably had very different emotional reactions to this movie. And it's a very, you know, it's a tough, tough uh, question. And... Uh, um, all we can do at this point is pray that um, it gets better. And Dr. Ben Natan, I want to thank you so much for spending the time to uh, give us your wisdom tonight on these very tough issues. Um, thank you everybody who has attended and written in questions. I'm sorry, I couldn't get around to all of them. Um, before we close, a reminder that tomorrow night's film, Song for Our People, begins at 7.30 p.m. Uh, tickets are on sale until an hour before uh, so please do go to the website, uh, teenacfilmfestival.org, for the schedule for the rest of the festival. Um, thank you, everybody, and good night.